Welcome to Five Stone. We are so glad you're joining us for worship this morning. If this is your first time visiting us today, you can go to fivestonechurch.com slash new here so that we have the opportunity to connect with you. Whether you're here in the building or worshiping with us online, we think life is better connected. So no matter what phase of life you're in, you're welcome here. Here are a few things we don't want you to miss. Hey, what is up guys? We are so excited to announce that coming up on July 19th through the 23rd, we have crazy summer nights. That is right, it is back. It is all of those nights from 6 to 10 p.m. Absolutely free event. You'll get divided off into teams. You will experience worship. You will compete in games and try to win the cup. That is right, the cup is back. Last year, the gold team won. This year, who knows who's going to win? Will it be you? Let's see you there. Hey y'all, my name's Kobe and I'm the creative pastor here at Five Stone. A few months back, we launched our new app through Planning Center called the Church Center app. This has been an incredible resource for us here at Five Stone. On it, you can watch live and previous services. You can register for upcoming events. You can sign up and see all of our classes that we offer through Five Stone University. You can give in a fast and completely safe way. And we have even more resources we're working on right now that will be available in the app soon. So I just want to encourage you, go get the app. It's available for download on all devices. If you have any questions about this, feel free to see us in the Connect Center right after the service or email us at info at fivestonechurch.com. Women of Five Stone, we would love to invite you to our upcoming Women's Crunch. We are so excited to gather together to encounter God's Word and connect with other women in community. We hope you'll invite your friends, co-workers, and neighbors to laugh, eat, and come away inspired to love Jesus more deeply. Today, a portion of our worship experience will be set aside to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you're joining us online, we want to give you the opportunity to gather the elements for the Lord's Supper. You can grab items such as juice, crackers, bread, whatever you have available. This is a time where we can reflect on God's sacrificial love for us and how we should respond to that love. We will explain a little more about this later in the service. With all that said, it's time to get started. Welcome to Five Stone. Hey, good morning, Five Stone. We're so glad that you're with us this morning, whether you're joining us online or here in the, in the building. We hope you have an awesome day. Let's celebrate. Stand together. Yeah. 
wish to be different, mountains that we need to be moved, and, and we have a God that can move mountains. We celebrate him today. Whatever your mountain is that you need that needs to be moved in your life, lay it at the feet of Jesus this morning.
Amen, amen. Man, there is nothing that our God can't do. And uh, man, we're so excited to worship this morning together and so thankful that you all are here. And welcome to those of you that are online with us as well. And this morning, we want to take a moment to, uh, to have a time to remember what the Lord has done for us through the cross and through uh, the Lord's Supper as we, as we remember uh, Jesus. And, and this morning, I want to just read from Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. It says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself. By assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by become, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. I don't know if there's a, a better verse that, that deserves an amen than that right there. That Jesus Christ, because of what he has done for us and deserves all glory to be praised that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And this morning, let's just take a moment to remember that, to remember what Christ did on our behalf, the way that he came and humbled himself and gave his life for us so that we could praise him, that we could honor him, that we could exalt him with all that we are and all that we have. And this morning, let's allow our lives to line up under that and just to, to remember once again and recommit once again to, to giving God all the praise that he is due, that he would get glory from our lives and we would live in a way that pleases him and honors him because of all that he has done for us. And so we're going to just take a moment to, to receive the Lord's Supper. If you're uh, uh, joining us online, man, I'd encourage you to, to get some of the elements. If you have some crackers and juice or whatever you have to be able to take the Lord's Supper with us, we'd invite you to do that as well. And if you came into the room, you should have received the elements uh, when you came in. If you didn't, just lift your hand and our ushers in the back will be able to bring some to you to make sure that you have everything that you need. And uh, man, we just want to encourage you to spend some time uh, just uh, reflecting on what the Lord has done for you and, and does your life line up with that and, and, and living in, in, in accordance to what Christ has done for us. And if there's some sin in our lives, man, I'd encourage you to, to confess that to him and just to, to get your heart and your mind right before the Lord and just to confess that sin. And after you've had a time to, to just spend uh, thinking about and, and praying with the Lord, then just reveal the re remove the top cellophane to remove uh, to reveal the the bread and be able to take that bread and just remember that Christ's body was broken for you for your behalf and just to take that in remembrance of him and then after you had a moment of that to re to remove the rest of the top to reveal the juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on your behalf for the forgiveness of your sins and just to remember that Christ has forgiven us totally and completely and we are forgiven and we can stand holy, not because of what we've done or because we have holy lives, but because he's declared us holy. He made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. We have the opportunity to stand before God with a clear conscience because of what Christ has done for us on our behalf. So let's receive the Lord's Supper. We're, the band's going to continue to lead us in worship. I'm going to pray. And as you do business with the Lord, you feel free to take the Lord's Supper there at your seat and then join us in, in continuing to worship uh, this morning as we, uh, as we continue to worship the Lord. Let me pray. God, we thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. God, you are an amazing, gracious, loving, patient Father. And God, thank you that even in our sin, in our rebellion, in our turning from you. God, you came for us. God, may that humble us as you humbled yourself. And God, could we return to you this morning? God, I pray even 
the lost heart would come to you this morning and, and believe in you for the very first time. God, I pray for the, the wandering heart that would come back to you and repent and, and come and, and just remember what you have done and may the remembrance of your sacrifice be what stirs us to come back to you. God, would the, the anxious heart be found at peace in your presence knowing that you have forgiven all. God, may we receive your grace this morning and, and live accordingly. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, amen. Well, man, it's been a good day of worship already, and God is just uh, is here and in this place, and we're excited to continue to worship Him. And man, we want to uh, just welcome all of you to uh, to Five Stone as well as those who are online, especially if you're new to our church, if you're visiting, uh, we would love to get a chance to get to know you. There's a communication card in the chair back in front of you, or you can uh, just uh, simply fill out a a connect card online by going to fivestonechurch.com forward slash welcome, and we would love to be able to connect with you as well as our pastors will be outside uh, by the Connect Center uh, on the way out and would love to get a chance to meet you if you uh, are here for visiting for the first time. We'd love to just be able to, to meet you and uh, get a, put a name to a face and be able to, to meet you. And man, God is doing so many neat things and so many amazing things this summer. There's already been so many incredible testimonies of what God has done through our children's and youth camps and just the way God is changing lives uh, through those camps as well as uh, we have crazy summer nights coming up this week, and it's going to be an amazing uh, week of ministry. There's already uh, many kids signed up for that. I mean, it's just going to be an amazing thing as we see God working in and through uh, this church, uh, using that to change lives. I mean, your offerings make a difference in, in being able to allow us to put on these programs and allow our kids to be able to, to be a part of that. And uh, so as we have our time of offering this morning, I just want to encourage you to, to give faithfully to the Lord. And we have our offering boxes that are placed around the room for those that are here. And if you're in the room or online, you can give uh, by th- in three different ways online by going through our church app, the Church Center app. If you haven't downloaded that, man, it's a great tool and a resource to be able to stay connected with all the things that are happening here at Five Stone. As well as you can go to fivestonechurch.com forward slash give. Or you can text to give, which is really simple. Just text the word Five Stone to 84321. And uh, excuse me, you don't have to do Five Stone. You just text the amount that you would like to give to 84321. And uh, you can follow the prompts there. And it makes it really easy and nice to be able to give online. I'm going to pray for us this morning. And we're going to get started and dive into the word as we continue in this series on one, the power of unity. Man, that's been a great series. Man, it's been good to see how God is is just shaping us and pulling us together as a church to be one body uh, fit for Christ. And so, man, I'm just going to pray for us and pray that God will continue to use uh, today's message as well to to really make uh, five stone what he desires for it to be. And so let me pray. God, we thank you so much for all that you are doing here. And we are so excited to see uh, you at work. And God, it's so amazing to to literally be able to see your your hands moving, changing hearts, changing lives, moving in our midst. And so, God, we just want more of it, more of you, more of your presence. God, make us to be more like you. God, we want to be your hands and feet that change the world. So, God, use us. Make us one. Make us uh, just a testimony to our community, to the surrounding neighborhoods, to everyone around us that uh, what it is that you are doing in and through us and and the, the power that comes with having a relationship with you. God, make us to be like you. God, your word says they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. Help us to be one. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. everybody. Well, welcome to Five Stone. I'm really glad you're here this morning. And uh, just like Pastor Chad said, we are wrapping up our series that we have called One, The Power of Unity. And uh, this series has dealt with the one another's in Scripture. You know, uh, we have said to you and, and tried to show you that there are so many that if you actually took each one another and just preached um, one one another a week, it would take um, two years 
to, to get through them. There's over a hundred of the one another's in Scripture, and it's so important that we uh, understand why these are given to us, that God must have had an, uh, something in mind when he placed this many one another's in the Word of God and, and has given them to us as a command, as something that you and I are to follow, that we are to do, that uh, God is interested in us keeping the commands and doing them and being obedient. And when we practice the one another's, like serve one another, encourage one another, uh, build each other up, pray for one another, uh, all of these things, we are really exhibiting uh, the mind and the heart and the life of Christ. We are living out the gospel, and that's what God has called us to do. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about one that's that's uh, pretty pretty difficult uh, to deal with, and uh, sometimes it's it's hard to to kind of get through. But uh, any of you. Uh, you know, ever been thankful that you've been forgiven, right? I mean, uh, when someone or God has extended forgiveness to you, isn't that such a blessing in your life? Uh, some of you, I don't think, care, uh, or you're just sitting there and you're not awake yet, but uh, surely you're grateful for forgiveness, right? I mean, come on. Uh, that is so true that when we think about being forgiven, it is so powerful in our life that, that God would extend this forgiveness to us, that we don't deserve it, we didn't earn it, we didn't merit it, we didn't do anything for it, but by His grace, He has extended forgiveness to us. But isn't it true that sometimes it's hard to extend that forgiveness to someone else? I won't make you show your hands, but I'll be the one to confess that this is something in my life that I had to work through, that when you have someone who has offended you, when you have someone who has sinned against you or maybe sinned against your family, you come to think about, man, uh, you know, it's hard sometimes to forgive. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to through the years of my ministry that I've heard these words, I could never forgive them for that. And sometimes what they're talking about is very serious. It's, it's, it's hurtful. It's, it's caused them much pain. It's, it's caused them great heartache in their life. And, and when you think about that, yes, to extend forgiveness in that situation is difficult. But God commands that we do that. God says, I want you to forgive one another just as I have forgiven you in Christ. And that is not something that, hey, it's, it's optional. If it's easy, it's optional. If it was just something that, that didn't cause us very much pain, it doesn't matter the degree of the, of the offense. It doesn't matter how much pain or how much hurt we might have experienced. God's command is that we would forgive one another. And sometimes that's really hard. And so today we're going to dig into that, and we're going to talk about what happens in our life when, when we don't forgive, but we're going to talk about also the, the great thing that can happen in our life when we do forgive. So hopefully you have a copy of God's Word, either electronically, book form, however you brought it this morning. We're going to be back in Ephesians 4. Last week, Pastor Garrett preached a powerful message out of the beginning verses of chapter 4, dealing with unity and lying to one another. and We're to speak truth uh, to one another. And basically, I think it's important we, we set the context here. As Garrett preached in verses 1 uh, down through 16, this is a call to unity and that we have to speak truth to one another. We have to tell each other the truth and we have to live the truth in a world that has abandoned truth. 
in a world that says everything is relativistic, everything is you own your truth, and if it's your truth, then it's okay, and you just live that out, you be you, you do you, and, and as long as you're true to yourself, then, then you're okay, and that is a very destructive path. And so the Apostle Paul laid that out, and Garrett really preached that last week, that we have to hold to truth, and we have to live truth, and we have to live in unity one to another. But in verses 17 through 32, the Apostle Paul then says, okay, this is how you live that unity out. You've got to live in holiness. And in verses 17 down through 24, he's talking about the way we we live in holiness. But I want us to focus in verses 25 down through 32. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. This is what the scripture says. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth each to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Now, let me just clarify here. What what we find, and if you really study the passage, this is not just an excuse to be angry as long as our anger doesn't lead to sin. This kind of anger that the Apostle Paul is mentioning here is a righteous indignation. It is an anger towards sin itself. And when he says, put away lying and speak truth to your neighbor, he's talking about the neighbor being your your brother or sister in Christ. That you and I are to not lie to our brother or sister in Christ. When we see them living in sin, we're to speak up about that. Be angry about the sin that you see in another person's life. And some of you may say, whoa, 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 time out, Jerry. Let's just, let's just stop here for a minute. You're talking about calling out someone else's sin. And we as brothers and sisters in Christ are called to do that for one another. That when we see one of us living in sin and walking in a destructive path, We're not to lie by just covering that up and thinking it's not a big deal. We're to speak truth to one another. Speak truth to your neighbor. Be angry and do not sin. Be be angry at the sin that you see happening in their life because you know that that path is leading to destruction. You know that path is leading to death. You know that path is leading to some very unhealthy things in their life. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun, and actually in the Greek, it says do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger. In other words, don't let the sun go down before you speak into that person's life, before you speak truth, before you speak life-giving words. Don't be afraid to confront sin. Now, we're to confront sin one to another in the body of Christ. And like the Apostle Paul says, I don't judge those who are outside of the body. When you see someone who is not a Christian and who is not a believer living in an unholy, uh, very sinful life, we should be able to understand that they're living that way because they do not have the life of Christ living in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They're not a true believer and follower of God. They're living in, in the way that who they are. They're living as a person who is separated from God, separated from the love of God. And the Apostle Paul teaches us, he says, I don't judge those who are outside of the body and living in sin. But he says, those who are in the body, if you claim to know Christ, then we're to help one another and to speak truth to one another and to call each other to righteous living. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down on on the cause of your anger. Be angry, have a righteous indignation, but do not sin. He goes on in verse 27. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Now this is huge. 
How does the devil have an opportunity in our life? In a lot of ways, but when we don't speak truth one to another, when we don't speak truth to our neighbor, then we're giving the devil an opportunity to continue to work in their life and to continue to destroy the good things that God wants them to experience. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. Any of you uh, tried to go out to a restaurant and you see hiring now signs everywhere and the wait times are like super incredibly long and you find that they've just got empty tables everywhere, you ask the management and what do they tell you? I'm sorry, we can't hire any wait staff. Do you realize people are getting paid to sit at home and do nothing? I won't get political today. (laughs) But basically, look what this says, right? If you're a believer and you're not working, you're not being obedient to the call of God. If you can work, you should work. Verse 29. Let no foul language, no putrid words in the Greek, it's, it's literally this idea of, of such words that are, are rotten and putrid. Let no foul language come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Verse 30, and do not grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Verse 31, Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And then verse 32, here's our last verse. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. Here's our one another for today. Forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. You see here in the Scripture that we are commanded to forgive one another just as God forgave us in Christ. Listen to me, folks. Extending forgiveness to someone is not optional. It's not something, hey, hey, you know, if I feel like giving you forgiveness, then, hey, here's forgiveness for you. But you know what? I don't think you deserve it. I I just don't think you deserve forgiveness yet. So I'm just going to withhold forgiveness. No, this is a command that you and I are called to forgive. I'll just kind of just give you the bottom line of the message. This is kind of the bottom line. The rest of it will just kind of be add-on. But here's the bottom line of the message. We forgive because we have been forgiven. If you are a follower of Christ, this is just the way it is. You're to forgive. If you've experienced forgiveness, if you've experienced the love and the grace and the mercy of God given to you, and when you didn't deserve it, then how can you withhold it from someone else? And I want to tell you, I just want to be real upfront and real honest. This is something that I had to really wrestle with at a time in my life. There was a situation, it's been many, many years ago, even inside the church with brothers and sisters in Christ, and it was just hard to forgive. And I knew that, that I needed to forgive But what instead, instead of practicing forgiveness, I was kind of stuck in unforgiveness. Rather than extending the forgiveness and the grace of God to the people that should have received it, I said, no, I'm just going to hold on to that. And here's what happens. Here's something that you and I need to understand. That when we don't extend forgiveness, you know this, and this is something I don't even have to say or teach today. 
it does nothing to the person who has offended you. They go on and they live their life. They go on and do whatever they're going to do. But when you and I don't extend forgiveness, when we live in unforgiveness, it causes some very serious problems in our life. It causes us some severe anguish and heartache. And I want you to understand something. That when we don't live in forgiveness, we are actually living in disobedience and we grieve the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. Verse 30 says that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He sealed us for the day of redemption. God's Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he is a person. He is a member of the Holy Trinity. And he can be grieved. He can be, be hurt. And when you and I are not extending forgiveness like God wants us to extend forgiveness, we actually grieve the Holy Spirit of God who's living inside of us. And here's another thing about that. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 through 11, the context there is forgiving. And I don't have time to unpack those verses for you today, but here's what I want you to understand. It tells us that unforgiveness is actually a tool of Satan in our life. It's one of his schemes. And Satan uses unforgiveness in our life to cause us much trouble and much heartache and much pain. And so what I want to do is I just want to kind of unpack some of the things that will happen because if you and I live in unforgiveness rather than forgiveness, it's like a magnet that draws negative and destructive things to our life. It's not just unforgiveness that we have to worry about. But in the context of this passage, we're going to see some other things that, that draw into our life when we live in unforgiveness. Now, so we, we, we want to be sure that, that we live in forgiveness. But here's the truth. The first thing that happens in our life when we don't live in forgiveness is we become bitter. We begin to live in bitterness. And that's exactly what this scripture says. That we're to put away bitterness. But what happens is when you're not a forgiving person, you cannot put away bitterness. It's going to be a mark of your life. You're just going to have a sour disposition. You're going to be grumpy. You're going to be ugly. You're, you're not going to be the kind of person that God wants you to be. You're, you're going to experience this bitterness flowing in your life. And here's what I want you to see this morning. With bitterness, it, it's, it's, it's to be put away. But what does actually bitterness mean? When you dig into the word bitterness, let me show you what it means here. First of all, it means like a gall. Now, now this is, this is something that, that is like sour. It's an extreme wickedness. The word, when you dig into it, it has this idea of a wickedness playing out in your life. There's a sour disposition, a sour attitude that happens in our life when we have bitterness in our life. Any of you ever known a bitter person? They're not much fun to be around. I mean, nothing is ever good enough. Nothing is ever, ever right. It's just like, man, they're just so sour, so bitter, so, so, I mean, it's just awful to be around those kind of people. And that's what the word actually means. And what happens from this is it produces a rotten kind of bitter fruit in our life. Rather than experiencing the fruit of the Spirit, listen to me, because we are grieving the Holy Spirit, 
we're not producing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We're not experiencing those things, but rather we're producing this rotten kind of bitter, sour fruit in our life. And it's all because we haven't forgiven. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says this. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root, look what it says, root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and defiling many. Make sure you don't have a root of bitterness in your life. In other words, root it out. When, when um, Jennifer and I at one time lived in LaGrange, Texas, any of you ever been to LaGrange, Texas? Okay. Um, so some of you have been down to LaGrange, Texas. Um, I was serving as a student pastor there uh, in a church, and um, the church owned uh, two homes. Uh, they had a newer home, and the senior pastor got to live in it, and they had an older home, and the youth pastor got to live in it. So that's the way we treat youth pastors, right? But I was grateful. We were grateful to be able to, to live in this home uh, there in LaGrange. I was serving as a student pastor, and in the backyard, there was this stump, and they had cut down a tree, but they had left about this much of the stump. And so I'd get out there and I'd mow the yard and it just seemed like over and over and over again, that stump started growing out limbs, right? And I'd have to, you know, chop off the limbs. I have to chop off the limbs and chop off the limbs. You know why that that kept growing back is because the roots were still there. And until you get to the root, it's going to keep producing things. And so bitterness is like a root in our life. It has to be rooted out. It has to be completely removed or else it's going to keep springing up and it's going to defile many. It's going to cause many people trouble, including yourself. Unforgiveness is a terrible thing and we don't want to live in unforgiveness. But... Uh, causes bitterness. But here's another thing. Unforgiveness also causes anger in our life. You ever known any angry people? You say, I'm sitting by some. No, don't do that today. Don't do that. So, yeah, don't, don't point anybody out. But anger is a terrible thing, right? And to be honest with you, this is one of the, the things that, that I really experienced in a season in my life when, when I wasn't living in forgiveness. I, I saw that I was, I was angry, angry at people who didn't deserve my anger. I'd take it out on my family, on my kids and, and people. It, it, it was just not pretty. And so the scripture says that you and I are, are called to live as forgiving people, not in anger. Well, what does the word actually mean here in the Greek? It's, it's like a passion that is burning inside of you, but it's not a good passion. It's like this angry heat that, that bubbles up. Here's the other thing. It's, it's like boiling over in your emotions, have you ever seen anyone who's, who's like an angry person and it's like they just kind of get on a roll in their emotions and they just can't control it and, and the anger just gets crazy? And that's what happens. Unforgiveness can cause that in our life. So we want to be sure that we're not unforgiving people because it'll cause bitterness cause anger. Here's the third one. You ready for it? See if we can. Wrath. We experience wrath in our life. Now, you may say, well, what is the difference between wrath and anger? 
Well, in the, in the Greek here, we're going to see this, that there is actually a difference between anger and wrath. And, and let me show you that uh, this morning. Here's, here's what the definition of wrath. It begins to impact your character. Now we're dealing with, with who we are becoming. We're becoming a person of wrath. We're not just experiencing any, any emotion, but now it's dealing with our, our character and it's taking over in our life. It's, it's like this deeper kind of, of problem that is, that is seeding in our life and it's becoming who we are. We're becoming this, this wrathful, vengeful kind of person. It actually deals with the soul. That, that as we, we dig into to wrath and, and understand what it is, it's an agitation of the soul. That, that I don't have peace, that, that I don't have this, this calm in my, in my soul. Remember the old hymn, it is well with my soul. It is not well with your soul when you are an unforgiving person. You're agitated, you're stirred up. And, and remember, the soul, suke, in the Hebrew, is, is like the seed of our emotions. And, and so if we're stirred up and if we're agitated in our emotions, we're, we're not going to experience the kind of love and joy and things that, that God wants us to experience. Ultimately, wrath can even lead to violent emotions. Someone can become violent. So we want to be sure that we're not exhibiting these things, that we're being forgiving people. Let not bitterness, anger, or wrath be mentioned around you. Here's the fourth one that the Scripture talks about, and that is slander. That you and I are to be sure that we're not people of slander. Now, what does that mean? Anybody ever heard, well, you know, they slandered me. They, they, they said this about me. And so now we're getting into speech. We're getting into our language. We're, we're getting into the words that we use. And so here's what I want you to see about slander. Slander is like this crying out. You're no longer silent that you are so worked up and, and things are so bad in your life that you're just going to cry out and, and you're going to try to try to hurt that person. You're going to call out and cry out and you're going to be doing things that, that are not um, healthy. The kind of speech that you have is injurious speech. You, you want to injure that person. You want to harm them. You don't speak life into them. You don't speak truth into them. You don't speak love into them. You want to hurt that person. I want to get them. They did this to me, and, and they, you know, did this. And, and we have to be very careful that we don't let this happen in our life. We want to harm their good character. We, we want to take their name down. We want to tear it down. And so we sure don't want to commit slander. And here's, here's the last one. And uh, Scripture says that you and I are not to experience malice in our life. Now, what in the world is malice? When we think about malice, let's dig into that a little bit and and look at the definition of malice. It is a wickedness and a depravity. This is how the word is actually defined. And we have become such people that we're not ashamed to break the laws. In other words, we don't care. We don't care about consequences. We don't care about our actions. We're willing to even break laws. We're, we're just people of malice. We're just going to do these things. We're going to act out. And the last one is this, that it's basically just a word that means evil. 
Now you're sitting here and you're going like, man, I'm so glad I came today. Like, come on, this is, this is depressing, Jerry. But isn't it sad that, that some people live in unforgiveness and they experience these things? And that's why verse 30, when you look at verse 30, what does it say? Put away bitterness. Put away anger. Put away wrath. Put away slander. Let let it not even be named among you. Put away malice. In other words, you're not to be that. Why? Because you and I are not to be what? unforgiving people we're to be forgiving people see there is a way you and I can live in forgiveness in verse 31 and 32 he's telling us he says this is what you need to do you need to be kind. You need to be tender-hearted, compassionate. You need to be forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ has forgiven you, you and I have to remember that you and I are forgiven people. We have been forgiven, so we are commanded to do what? Forgive. Now, what happens when we forgive? What happens in our life when we extend forgiveness to other people? And this is so powerful. This is is so, so incredible that you and I begin to live in obedience and our life begins to be marked by the attributes of Christ. That people begin to see Jesus in us. And, and listen to me, the deeper the hurt and the stronger the, the, the offense and, and the, the more wicked the, the committal that, that might have happened against us when we forgive in that way, that's what blows the world away. The Phoenix Suns are in the NBA Finals. Some of you are saying, so what? Yeah, I haven't watched much of it either, you know. I mean, Luca's not there, LeBron's not there, you know. But the Phoenix Suns are, are there. And the head coach of the Phoenix Suns, a few years ago, his wife was killed by a driver who was under the influence of methamphetamines. And he's a believer in Christ, and this is what he said. I must forgive that person for what they've done because I cannot live with an unforgiving spirit. Even though his wife had been killed, he said, I've got to forgive. And see, that is a powerful testimony for a Christ-like attitude and an attribute. And we begin to display those What are some of those? Well, first one is just to be kind. Man, wouldn't you agree that our world just needs a little kindness? Just just a little love, just a little kindness. Hey, let's, let's just be kind to one another. We may disagree with one another. I may not, you know, agree with your lifestyle, but that doesn't mean I have to hate on you. It doesn't mean I have to hurt you. It doesn't mean I have to be unkind to you. I, I can be kind. Jesus spoke the truth, but he did it, what, in love. Be kind. What in the world does it mean when we're kind? Well, it's really cool that this Greek word actually means you are now fit for use. You realize an unkind person really just isn't fit for use. My wife says, hey, Jerry, remember you'll, you'll, you'll attract more, more uh, bees with the honey. Or, is that what it goes, something like that? How do you, you attract more flies? You, why would you want to attract flies? What's the saying, Jen? You attract more bees with honey. Okay. 
than vinegar. Okay. So in other words, be sweet. That's what I'm trying to say, right? I mean, just be sweet. Be kind. I mean, you're fit for use. I'm, don't worry, in the second service, I ain't going to say that. So, You'll be virtuous and good. Wouldn't that be awesome to be marked in our life? Say, look at this person. They're, they're fit for use. They're virtuous and they're good. Here's the last one. That we're actually useful for the gospel when we're kind to one another. Verse 32 says, you and I are called to be compassionate like Jesus is compassionate. Jesus looked out at the multitudes and he had compassion on them. He, he hurt for them because they were not following the Lord. You and I need to have a compassionate uh, heart in us. And th what that word actually means is moved to act in love. You and I are actually called to act in love. That's why in the context in verses 25 and 26, you know, it says, speak truth one to another. Speak truth to your neighbor. We're called to move and act in love. We're not called just to sit back and do, do nothing. We're to have compassion on those who are hurting. We're to have compassion on those who need to see the gospel in action. We're to be moved to act in love. The word actually can also be translated tenderhearted. You ever known anyone just have a tender heart? I've known some few in our church. They have such a tender heart. They're so compassionate. They just begin to talk and they just begin to weep. I mean, they, they, just, they just exhibit a tender heart. Be kind, compassionate, tenderhearted. And then we're called to be forgiving. And let's dig into this as we wrap up. What does it actually mean when I am forgiving? It means that I'm pleasant and agreeable. I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. I don't have wrath or slander working in my life. It means that I understand what it means to extend pardon because I myself have been pardoned. It's kind of interesting when you see an outgoing president, you know, and all of them extend the, the pardons, and you're going like, man, you know, they extended, you know, this many pardons, and did they deserve them? Well, not necessarily. It's just a pardon. It's just like, here you go. And that's what God has called us to do. It's the idea of giving freely because we have freely been extended forgiveness. We're to give it freely. And this leads us to, to practicing a restoration in our life, not a, a separation in our life, but restoration and bringing it back. And that's really the whole heart of the gospel is restoring people to wholeness. Forgiveness. We love it, don't we? Man, I'm so thankful I'm forgiven. We need to extend it and give it as much as we love to receive it. So I have a question for you as a next step this morning. Is there anyone in your life or any unforgiveness that you're holding on to in your life. Are you experiencing forgiveness or would we hang the, the two letters in front of it? Which one's going on with you? I, just let the Holy Spirit just kind of sink in. It, is, is there a person? Is there a situation? Is there a circumstance? Is there something going on that, that you're holding on to and it's unforgiving in your life? I'm telling you, man, it will lead to some bad things in your life. So I would encourage you in this moment, just ask, 
our Heavenly Father to help you lay that aside. You see, it's hard on our own. I know, I've been there. But with the Holy Spirit's help, He can set you free. You can lay it down. And the easiest thing to remember is to remember that you have been forgiven. So forgive. We're forgiven people. God calls us to forgive one another. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the truth of Scripture that teaches us to love one another and encourage one another. And today, I pray that we would practice forgiveness. I pray that that would be operable in our life, that we would see that lived out on a daily basis. I pray for those online, maybe today, who have never experienced your forgiveness and your grace. And God, would you draw yourself to them right now? Just through the Holy Spirit, may they experience your love and forgiveness and grace. For those who are in the room this morning, I, I pray the same thing, God, that they would experience your love and your grace, your forgiveness. Help us to be forgiving people because we've been forgiven. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Our worship team's going to close us out. It's not just a song to pack up and get ready to go, but it's a song. It's a time for us to stop and to think, God, what have you done today in my life? How are you moving in my life? We call it a response time. And maybe you need to respond right where you are. Maybe you want to go and speak to a prayer team member or a pastor and pray with them in the back. Maybe you want to pray for someone else. But it's a time for us to let God work. We didn't come in here just to walk out the same. We came to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let God do that in your life as we worship Him right now.
We'll see you next week.